16, starting at verse 16 today, and the plan is to finish chapter 16 and move on to chapter 17 next week. Hi, it may be a little bit ambitious, but I'm hoping to do all of chapter 17 next week since it is Jesus' prayer before going to the cross. I don't really want to split that into two pieces, so we'll see how that goes next week. But today, John chapter 16, starting in verse 16, and continue out to, to verse 33, hopefully. Uh, so let's open a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come together to worship you, to fellowship with other believers, and to look into your word and to see what you have for us. Pray for those working down the hall with the younger kids and the teens that you bless this time. And pray for the morning service as pastor brings the message a little bit later. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, the rest of John chapter 16 is, I'm going to split into two different sections. The first one being verses 16 to 24, with the theme being Jesus turning the disciples' grief to joy. And as we've been working through the past few weeks, John chapters 13 through 16, Jesus' farewell discourse after the Last Supper, where he's preparing his disciples for a transition where they have been living with him, hearing his words directly from him with him being physically present, to Jesus preparing them for his departure through his death resurrection, and then ascension to the Father with this farewell discourse. And we've talked about this as we've gone through it, that it starts with an introduction or prologue in chapter 13. And then today we'll see the ending, the epilogue, which is in parallel to that prologue. And in between, there are six sections, five of which we've completed. The first three of those sections dealt more with themes of Jesus' relationship to his disciples and the hope that comes from that. The second three have been more of a focus on the relationship between the disciples and the world in participating in Jesus' ministry, but then also we've seen participating in the hate that the world turned against Jesus. And verses 16 to 24 is the final of those six sections preparing the disciples for this transition where Jesus will be physically leaving but won't be abandoning them and that he's sending the Holy Spirit. I should have also mentioned there is a handout in the back. It is not a different one from last week. It's the same. Last week's handout had all of, of 16, but if you didn't get that last week or want another copy, there are a few copies at the back still. And this section can be broken into two subsections. The first part, verses 16 to 18, confusion regarding what it means to see God by the disciples. And as one commentator pointed out, by even commentators today, as far as figuring out what exactly these verses mean. And then the promise of even though there will be coming grief and sorrow, a transition to joy. So let's start in verse 16 of John chapter 16. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, What is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. And now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said, A little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me. And through these verses, hopefully you've noticed something that's being repeated. There's an emphasis on a little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me. It's, it's repeated there three times. Three times. 
And from a literary standpoint, any time we see something that's repeated multiple times, there's an important emphasis on it that this is something important enough not just to write and say once, not just to write and say twice, but three times. And that's also partially emphasizing here that very clearly the disciples don't quite know what this is referring to. And as I mentioned, there are some commentators who disagree on what this is referring to as far as the first little while, so back in verse 16, a little while and you will not see me. Most are pretty much in agreement that this refers to Jesus' death and crucifixion on the cross. This farewell discourse is preparing the disciples for that event that's going to happen the next day after this. And to us, the farewell discourse is a little bit easier to understand because we know where this is going. Whereas the disciples, even though in some ways they had been told this, they didn't completely grasp it yet. And that's very understandable because They've been spending the last three years with Jesus and coming to recognize from his word that he's the Messiah. And they were looking for a Messiah who would set up an earthly kingdom and liberate Israel. They weren't understanding that this Messiah came to die to liberate a world from sin and darkness. And until that happened, it would just be something that would be very difficult to grasp. So the first a little while is he's reemphasizing something that's come up through the farewell discourse and through the last few chapters that we've seen is that he is going away and that going away is through death on the cross, resurrection, and ascension back to his father. We've talked about in the Gospel of John how that there's a reference to Jesus' hour. And tied in that, in the Gospel of John, is very much death, resurrection, ascension, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit. Those events are not separated in the Gospel of John. They're seen as being just so tightly knit together, they can't be separated out. Because the death was putting in motion the resurrection and victory over sin, the ascension back to the Father as Jesus completed what he was sent to do, and then not abandoning the newly forming church, but sending the Holy Spirit to continue the ministry and work of God in the believer, and specifically here in the disciples who would have been the foundation of that early church. But that's easier to understand and see looking back at the whole picture rather than where they were just having celebrated the Passover supper, just having celebrated the triumphal entry of Jesus a day before coming into Jerusalem, on their minds is not in a little while he's going to die. But the second little while, and you'll see me, there have been two or three different interpretations that have been. Some think that it refers to Jesus' second coming. The context here and everything else, that doesn't fit at all. Second, which is a common interpretation, is you will see me again, is the disciples seeing Jesus after he's resurrected. After Jesus dies on the cross and is resurrected, the only people he appears to at that point are disciples and believers. There are no more public appearances at that point. And certainly that's possible. But reading all of verse 16, a little while and you will not see me, and again, a little while and you will see me, because I go to the Father. That adds a little bit to it. He's saying, in a little while you will see me because he's going to the Father. Well, once he ascends to the Father after his resurrection, other than Paul, 
No believers physically see Jesus as recorded in the Bible. Because at that point, it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that is the presence of God on earth rather than the physical presence of Jesus as the Messiah. And so this because they go to the Father, there are some commentators who also point out that in the Greek, the two words for see used here are slightly different words. The first one is see as in physically seeing something. The second will see is a more of a seeing on an inward spiritual level. And so there are some who think that the best interpretation of this is a little while you will not see me, his death on the cross and his resurrection and his ascension. Because Jesus is preparing them for physically leaving earth through those three events that in the Gospel of John are just tied together as if they are one event. And then again, a little while, and you will see me because I go to the Father. We see, saw earlier in the farewell discourse that Jesus promised that in leaving the disciples, he wasn't abandoning them. He was sending the spirit of truth that would dwell in the believer and would guide and comfort and teach and counsel and help them to understand the truths that Jesus was teaching directly to the disciples through his words and then to us what had been written down by individuals like John in the word of God. And that the a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father is a continuation of that promise that the believer will see him through the Holy Spirit. And we saw last week that one of the promises that Jesus gave is that when he get, went to his Father, he would send the Holy Spirit. And so at Pentecost, when the disciples received that anointing the Holy Spirit, and it changed from the Old Testament model of the Holy Spirit temporarily coming on an individual to empower them to, under the church age, the believer being sealed with the Spirit, that the Spirit comes down in the believer at the point of salvation or for the disciples the point of Pentecost and remains on them and remains on us. As a promise that Jesus was telling the truth when he said, that he was ascending to his father victorious over sin. When that happened at Pentecost, the, the disciples remembered those words and remembered, oh, he didn't abandon us. He really is with his father. He really is one with God the Father and has sent the spirit so that we would be one with him. And very likely that's what this is, which is why you can see why with various commentators today, even seeing the big picture, a little while and you will not see me, and again, a little while and you'll see me because I go to the Father, would have been really difficult at that point for the disciples to understand, which is why their confusion is repeated here. And why at the point of Pentecost where they had the Holy Spirit, this made a lot more sense to John and to the others. In verse 19, now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. He recognized their confusion, and rather leaving them in confusion, he goes on in 19 through 24 to dispel that confusion to some extent. Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while and you'll not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? He knew that this was confusing. He knew that this was something at this point that wasn't clear and, and, and plain. And so he goes on in verse 20, most assuredly I say to you, and in some English translations that would be truly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. And here, you'll weep and lament. He knows that the next day, they're going to face 
seeing him arrested and crucified on a Roman cross in a horrific way. And they are going to be troubled. They are going to have grief. They are going to have sorrow because of this loss and because they don't completely quite understand that in order for them to have life, in order for us to have life, Jesus had to die. But he goes on to give them hope in this and saying that, yes, despite the fact that you'll weep and, and, and lament, and despite the fact the world would rejoice at Jesus' death, thinking that they had been victorious in killing this troublemaker. He says, yes, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Not because their life won't have trials and troubles, but rather because of the realization of what that death brought and what the resurrection and ascension meant. It meant the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about last week that, you know, sometimes as you know, believers in this time period, we can look back at the disciples and be envious and say, oh, I wish I had lived when Jesus was walking on the earth. But Jesus himself had told the disciples earlier in this farewell discourse that as great as that was, what was coming, the indwelling Holy Spirit, would be far greater. And we're living with that far greater, and sometimes we're envious of what we think was better. And Jesus himself said no. That wasn't. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is better and greater because it turns our sorrow into joy, because of what the coming of the Spirit meant. That only occurred because God fulfilled what he had promised at the Garden of Eden when humankind sinned and fell, that he would crush the serpent's head despite the serpent bruising the son's heel. That was a promise that every human from Adam and Eve looking forward, we're looking forward, Jesus coming, dying, resurrected, and ascending. And the proof to the believer that that really happened was the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so then Jesus, in verse 21, uses an illustration A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. And so an illustration has been used, and there's a number of things packed into this illustration. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. That use of hour there isn't just a a coincidence. That's been used throughout the entire Gospel of John to refer to Jesus' hour where he came to fulfill what he was sent to do, to die on the cross for sins, be resurrected, ascend, and then show the fulfillment of that promise of sending the Holy Spirit to guide and direct the church. But he's, he's also acknowledging here that just as childbirth is extremely painful, that this transition, what the disciples are about to go through, is not going to be easy. It is going to be filled with trial. It is going to be filled with, with pain. But the end result is the joy of life. Now, in the illustration, it's a joy of a mother seeing a physical baby that has come into the world, physical life. Here, though, this illustration is illustrating something much greater, that the trial and sorrow that is to come, the end result is spiritual life through Christ. And notice also, a human being has been born into the world. Throughout the Gospel of John, the world is pretty much only used in a negative way. And the world is always tied to that image of darkness, of sin. Where Jesus is the light that comes to that darkness to bring life. And it is through, in this case, the pain and suffering of his death on the cross that the disciples 
and every believer since then could have joy through the life that that brings. Continue in verse 24, Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Verse 22, there's a shift where instead of saying, as I said before, you will see me, it shifts to Jesus saying, but I will see you again. That's a promise that Jesus, as the resurrected, victorious king in heaven, isn't on some high throne Well, we can see the king, but the king doesn't acknowledge and see us. It is a relationship that was shown throughout the gospel with the illustration of the sheep and the shepherd. It was emphasized in that, that Jesus as a shepherd knows his sheep, but it was also emphasized that the sheep know Jesus. Both the believer will see Jesus and the truth of Jesus through the spirit, but additionally, Jesus sees the believer, knows the believer's needs, and is there to support the believer through the Spirit. It's both ways. It's not this this king who's gone and ascended and after the coronation is too great to see the common people, the little people. The little people can see the king sitting on high. It's not that image. It's looking both ways. And because of that, Joy is mentioned twice in this verse. Your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And again, this isn't a joy or rejoicing that we have no troubles, we have no trials, etc. It's more an understanding that because of what Jesus has done, we have hope in eternal life, we have hope in a risen Savior, we have hope in a life and living God. But that hope had to come through the death and resurrection of Christ. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. In the context directly to the disciples here, they have spent the last three years where they have been directly talking to Jesus, and asking him questions, asking him things, and he's given to them. Now he's saying there's a transition here. And the transition is because of the completed work that he's doing, the believer now can go boldly through the throne of God and ask God the Father directly without needing to go to the temple through the high priest, without needing to go to a temple to a priest, because that was enabled through the death and resurrection of Christ, making the relationship that was broken between humankind and God complete again and whole again for those who trust and believe. And again, what does that bring? It brings joy. Like three verses here, joy has been mentioned four times. And this is in the context of reminding those disciples because the next day they are not going to have joy. Because they're going to be focused on their sorrow and they're going to be scattered. So in the farewell discourse... Uh, that is the last of the six sections of the core subject of it, and it ends on this very triumphant promise of joy four times through grief being turned to joy. And so the last section we'll look at in the farewell discourse today is verses 25 to 33, an epilogue that wraps this up 
and ties back in for the disciples and the readers themes that started with the introduction. And we'll see there's some parallels between the, the, the prologue introduction to the farewell discourse that come back up again, both in Jesus' words, but also in the disciples' reactions to those words. So starting in verse 25, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time or the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And we saw in the farewell discourse in some of the other sections that phrase, these things I have spoken come up. Last week's, last week's section, there was a theme throughout it of Jesus saying, these things I have spoken, these things I have spoken. In John chapter 16, verse 1, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. In verse 4, but these things I told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And so by starting this section, this, this wrapping up conclusion epilogue, with these things I have spoken to you, this should trigger in the reader's mind, and it should have triggered in the disciple's mind, that these things that he spoke were spoken that we wouldn't stumble when we face trials, when we are troubled, when we are facing sorrow, that rather than focusing on the trial, the suffering, focus on the promised joy, the promised hope in eternal life. And this isn't a hope, when we talk about the hope that God gives, it isn't a hope like, well, I hope it's going to be sunny today. I hope that work's going to go today. And when it happens, we see if that happens. A hope from the perspective of God is we should have a confident expectation that he will do what he has promised, despite the trials, despite the sorrow. And that's what Jesus is drilling into the disciples here and reminding them, yes, these sorrows are going to come. Yes, really awful things are going to happen tomorrow that are going to shock you. And when that happens, remember the things that Jesus had spoken to them. Partially because after the death and resurrection, those things will make a lot more sense. But also, in the turmoil, in the sorrow, in the fear, that gives hope that leads to joy. He's saying here, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. He's also acknowledging to them that many of the things that he has said are in parable form or illustration form or figurative form that without the leading of the Holy Spirit, they, the disciples themselves may not yet understand. And he's promising, though, there is a time, there is an hour coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father, and that would be through the guidance of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, one of the Holy Spirit's role is to teach and guide the believer. Not in new doctrine, but a continuation of Jesus' ministry and purpose that he came to. So here when he's saying, I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will speak to you plainly about the Father after the hour. Well, since after this hour he's ascending back to his Father, he's not going to have a lot of physical on earth teaching time. So he's referring to here teaching and speaking plainly to the believer through the working of the Holy Spirit and through the words that a disciple like John wrote down or Paul wrote down, so that we can see plainly and better understand. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came forth from the Father. So the other thing that this will inaugurate, this hour of his death and resurrection, would again inaugurate the believer being able to come boldly to the Father to make request rather than needing to go through a high priest or a priest. 
or some intermediary. Now, there is an intermediary in his intercession, and that would be Jesus Christ's death and resurrection making this possible. But here is pointing out, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray to the Father for you. He's saying that the disciples and the believers themselves will pray directly to the Father in the work and name and purpose of Jesus Christ, which Jesus Christ completed on the cross. And the reason for this, we see in verse 27, for the Father himself loves you. And here, it's an echo back to John 3.16, the whole reason God sent his son to die was because he loved us in our sins, in our darkness. And an emphasis here that we, God doesn't love us because we loved him first. It's not that God loves us because we, we're obedient to him, but rather because God the Son, Jesus Christ, was obedient to the Father and died. We can respond to that love with love. Our love is a response to the love that God gives. And in this verse 27, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. In there, there are two things that are pointed out that are necessary for access to God the Father. One, it's based on God's love for us. Our love is a response to that. And, a, and not only a response, but a result of that. God doesn't love us in response or result for our devotion and love and obedience. It's our love, devotion, and obedience is a result and a response to his love first. And then the second is access to God is based on belief and work of God sending his son to die and resurrect. There's an object to the faith. It's not just believing in a God. It's believing in, a, in the specific God and an action that that God did out of love to the humans. And so here, two criteria. Access to God is based on God's love for human in our sin and sending his son. And then access to God is based on our response and belief in that. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So this has been a theme throughout the farewell discourse as Jesus preparing the disciples for the truth that he came from the Father and echo back to the first chapter of John. John chapter 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shines into the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend or overcome it. And so the Gospel of John started with, for the reader, that truth that Jesus was with God in the beginning, was God from the beginning, and was sent as a light to a dark world. But he wasn't sent as a light to stay here. He was sent to do a specific thing, and that is die on the cross, be resurrected, and ascend, and then commission and send the Holy Spirit to continue that work. This was a theme that showed up in the introduction to the farewell discourse. It went the wrong way. Chapter 13, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. And so now I say to you, he was preparing them that he is physically leaving. And here he reemphasizes this at the end of the epilogue, that he really is leaving them. And here, there we go. 
Here, though, the disciples' response, we can see that they don't quite get it yet. His disciple says to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Now at first it might seem that suddenly the light bulb's going off in their head and they're no longer confused by the figurative language because they're like, see, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. There's a couple problems with that. Verse 25, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time, the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. He's saying in that verse that there is a time in the not too distant future, after his death and resurrection and ascension, the coming of the Holy Spirit, that these things that he spoke figuratively will be spoken plainly and the disciples will understand them. But he was saying in verse 25, that's something that when he said those words, was future. The disciples heard those words and immediately went to, yes, now we understand, now we see. They're smiling and nodding because they don't want to be the student in the class who didn't get the lesson. But they didn't get the lesson. And one of, like I said, the indications is Jesus himself said, they're not going to understand these words yet until the hour is come and fulfilled. So the fact that they turn right around immediately and say, oh yes, we understand, either they're wrong or Jesus is wrong. And I think we know which one was wrong. Um, and, and this isn't to, you know, somehow disparage the disciples. When Jesus said that to the disciples, it wasn't that he was trying to disparage them or anything like that. He was, he was speaking a truth because he knew they were confused and were going to get more confused. And it was a truth that they would see that, okay, right now I'm confused, but if I focus on the words that Jesus said, if I focus on that, he's promised that that confusion will be dispelled very soon. And if I just don't give up and I don't walk away, I will understand, even though I don't quite understand right now. And I think the same thing applies to us. Sometimes we read something. Sometimes the Holy Spirit prompts us. Sometimes a message that pastor brings prompts us to be a little bit confused. And in those times, we should think back to and meditate on the words that were spoken and on prayer to God the Father asking for understanding, asking for clarity, and he will speak plainly to us. The other reason is in the context of the farewell discourse. Let's see if I have it here. Back in John chapter 14, as part of the farewell discourse, Jesus says, but now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. And at that time, it goes on to explain that they were asking the wrong question. Peter had asked, where are you going? Because Peter was really wanting to know, why are you leaving us? We like what we see as the Christian life, the follower of Christ. The disciples liked the fact that their leader, the Son of God, was physically with them, that they could follow. And they liked that. And the thought of him leaving brought sorrow to them. And so their focus was more on themselves and the sorrow that the loss of Christ is bringing and not quite understanding that this was necessary in order for them to have life. And so here, this misunderstanding is that same misunderstanding. They're focusing on the wrong thing. They're focusing on the sorrow that comes with Jesus' departure. They're not focusing on the joy that comes with the coming of the Holy Spirit and the completion of Jesus' work. 
We also saw in the introduction itself, and this being the prologue, or excuse me, the epilogue, the conclusion to the farewell discourse, often when you have a book, what's in the introduction is mirrored in the conclusion, and then what's in between is supporting that. Well, the same thing here. At the end of the introduction to the farewell discourse, there was a conversation directly between one of the disciples, Simon Peter and Jesus, that went something like this in verses 36 to 37 in chapter 13. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? Why can't I do what I want to do? I don't want to lose you. I want to follow you. Not only that, I'm so dedicated, Peter goes on to say, I will lay down my life for your sake. Well, Peter had it backwards. Peter, dying for Christ, would do nothing because Jesus didn't need somebody to die for him. And so in the introduction to the farewell discourse, this discussion occurred and it was followed by Jesus rebuking Peter and then letting Peter know he was going to deny Christ. Here we see different words, different speakers. It's now no longer just Simon Peter. It's all of the disciples, but a similar misunderstanding. They think Jesus is speaking plainly. They think they've got it all figured out. They're focusing more on what they believe about themselves than what they believe about Jesus. They think in themselves they have knowledge that Jesus has just pointed out to them they don't have yet. We need to sometimes be patient as Jesus reveals his truth to us and not think we've connected the dots before Jesus has actually given us the dots to connect, so to speak. And so in the introduction, we had Simon Peter with this misunderstanding and misbelief that needed to be corrected. We now see that at the end of the farewell discourse, all of the disciples are in a similar spot. And in both cases, oh, I went a little too far there. That's in the wrong spot. There we go. In both cases, Jesus responds to this misunderstanding the same way, with an ironic rhetorical question. His response to Peter in the introduction was, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. And he cracks Peter and rebukes Peter and says, no. You're not laying your life down for Christ. Christ is about to lay down his life for you, Peter. And then he emphasizes, not only is Peter not going to do that, he is going to be so troubled, he's going to deny Christ and abandon Christ temporarily. He doesn't abandon permanently because when that happens and he is greatly troubled, Peter turns back to the things that Jesus said and then they make sense. And he understands he wasn't called to lay down his life for Christ, but rather called to proclaim that Christ laid down his life for the world. And we see the same thing here at the end in chapter 16. Jesus' response, and this is a, kind of the third reason we know that they really don't understand at this point, is Jesus answers them in verse 31 of chapter 16, do you now believe? Now granted, we, if we read that as just a quizzical question, they'd be like, oh, you believe now, great. But in the Gospel of John, irony is, in rhetorical questions are used quite a bit. This should be read with a much more ironic bent as far as, do you now believe, really? Kind of like the response to Peter, are you really going to die for Christ? Do you now believe? And he follows it up in verse 32. Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, now has come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. 
And yet, I am not alone because the Father is with me. He's telling them the exact same thing he told Peter. They are going to abandon him at his death. They are going to be scattered. They are going to be on their own rather than being one with him where they should be. But he lets them know that he won't be alone in that hour because the Father is with him. That echoes really strongly back to Peter's statement because Peter's statement was, no, Lord, you can't leave us. No, Lord, you can't do this. I want to go with you. Why can't I do this? I will die for you. Here Jesus is correcting him and saying, no, that he alone is the one who is going to go to the cross and die because he alone is the only one who could do that and did do that. And that Peter has it backwards at that point. But he's also letting Peter know, because Peter and the other disciples would have been concerned, and we'll see it as a rest, are very concerned that they need to protect Jesus somehow. They need to protect the leader. They need to protect him. And he's saying, no, you're going to be scattered. You are not equipped to protect. But he's assuring them, just like he assured them that he is not abandoning them by leaving them, he's sending the Holy Spirit. He's also now assuring them in that hour when they abandon him, it's okay because he will not be abandoned by his father because he's doing what the father said. And then the farewell discourse ends with one last final exhortation and promise. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. In some translations, be courageous. I have overcome the world. He's following this statement that they will abandon him, they will be scattered with this promise that in him you will find peace and face tribulation with joy and courageousness because he has overcome the world. He's giving them hope that when they are troubled the next day, when they are scattered, when they do abandon him, when they stop from the panic of the moment and they think back to his words, it will draw them back to the peace and the joy. And the same thing applies to us. Often we can get a spot where we don't understand. We do the wrong thing. We get troubled. We are in grief. And we need to go back to this, thinking back to the words that Jesus spoke, and understand that he overcame all of those. Throughout the farewell discourse, there were some key verses we picked out on. John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Here he's saying to the disciples, you're going to be so troubled, you are going to abandon. He said to Peter at the beginning, you are going to be so troubled, you're going to deny me. But in between, he said, when that happens, don't let your heart be troubled. The solution is focus on God, focus on Jesus. And then in verse 16, restates it in a different way. Excuse me, 16.1. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. And that when we do stumble, we focus back on the things that he said. And that was repeated because we stumble frequently and we need to go back to that promise. And that promise goes back to where the Gospel of John started. The light shines in darkness, and darkness did not comprehend it. And we talked about that in the Greek, the word that's translated comprehend can have two different translations, comprehend or overcome it. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, but the darkness did not overcome it. He's saying here that the believer will have comprehension through the promise of the Holy Spirit and through the words that Jesus spoke and that were recorded. And because of that, the world did not overcome Jesus. The world will not overcome the church. And as I said a little bit earlier, in the Gospel of John, whenever world is mentioned, 
It's a negative connotation of the darkness of sin, which is why the light came. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for these words that you've given us and, and help us to focus back on your words when we are troubled, when we do stumble, and when we struggle, that we would look back and recognize that we're in good company. The disciples struggled also. But when they turned their eyes back to you, you helped them to do great things in your name. In Jesus' name,